Hi everyone, um, I hope you enjoyed our presentation segment of the conference. I for one enjoyed it seeing everyone's presentations, all the students doing work. Um, so now we'll be starting our alumni panel portion of the event and I'd like to introduce Laura Yang, our SIA ambassador, who will be moderating the panel. As well, if you have any other questions for the alumni panel, you might type in, in the chat. Thank you. Oh, um, Irina, do we have the those um Pardon? Do we yes, have all the panel members, you guys can turn your camera on and join the screen okay. um, just for Eric to introduce you all. Hi, Sean. Hello. Hi. Diana? Yeah. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Yeah, well, let's wait another two to join us. Sounds good. Howard, okay. So, welcome, Howard. Hello. And uh, we should have. Uh, Kathleen, right? Oh, hi. Hi, Kathleen. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, really uh, welcome, uh, you know, alumni folks uh, for coming back to, uh, you know, our AFCAD community to share with us your experience and insights in your professional practices that, you know, our current students, uh, faculties, and staffs uh, really care about. Okay. And also welcome all the audiences for coming to the panel uh, discussion. And to let the audience get a bit about uh, you know uh, your background, I would like each of you introduce about yourself in terms of your name, a school you graduated from, year of graduation, and what uh, you are doing right now. So let's start from Howard, and then we'll go around the table. So followed by Kathleen, Sean, and Tiana. So Howard, let's start from you. Great. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Howard Dai. Uh, I graduated from School for the Contemporary Arts um, with a BFA in Theater Performance. Um, actually, just last year, my graduation day was last year. So, didn't get a confrontation, I got a pizza box in the mail. Um, but, yeah, that's a special kind of uh, graduation I received. And uh, I'm currently the Associate Artistic Producer at Rice and Beans Theater, which is a theater company in Vancouver. Okay, great, thanks. So, Kathleen, please. Yeah, um, my name is Kathleen Estonislau. I am a SFU graduate. I graduated in the Faculty of Communications with a minor in Publishing in 2016. And then I'm currently working at a digital marketing agency as the digital marketing manager at Market One Media Group. Okay, done, right? Thanks. Yeah, now come to Sean. Uh, yeah, my name is Sean Warwick. I graduated from the School of Interactive Arts and Technologies in FCAT back in, it would be 2015, so a little bit now. And nowadays I work at uh, Relic Entertainment as a UX designer slash game designer. Okay, thanks, Jim. Um, so, yeah, Kiana, yeah. your turn. Hi, I'm Tiana. I graduated from SFU with a degree in communication and minor in publishing. I currently work as a marketing coordinator at an architecture firm called WA Architects, but a lot of my experience is also in the music industry. I was also on the CMNSU team for a few years. So yeah, okay. I'm excited to do this today. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, next, uh, so we're going to just uh, go through, you know, um, some questions that uh, we think so our community, our students uh, just care about, and then um, in terms of, you know, what you end up with you as of now, okay, and then uh, uh, probably, so uh, our, our audiences will also have their questions based up along the way, and uh, we'll see, so uh, if time allows, we'll also just, you know, to pick some questions uh, from, uh, you know, uh, the, what whatever would come up, and then uh, just to ask you guys to just, um, you know, give your, insights about uh, you know the answers to give answers to those questions so um my let's just pick from the list that we prepared so uh, my first question to to you all is uh, so we care about what is something you have learned from the job that you have right now that uh, you wish you knew when you were at school so again so let's just maintain the order to make things a bit uh, smooth so uh, starting from uh, Howard uh, Again, and uh, followed by you know the order. Just try to remember your order, and also because time limit, I'm sorry that I can only give each of you up to 18, uh, 80 seconds. Okay, so I have to remind you when it's uh, so at one minute, then you have to wrap up. You know, 
uh, to give the chance to text people to talk. Okay, so again, so Howard, please. Well, I'm always generous by uh, sharing many of my seconds to the other people because I'm the first one to go and probably can't say that much because I don't have time to think about it that well. Um, uh, I found it, it's so easy to, um, to reach out to people. That's what I learned that, um, I mean, this is maybe specific in theater or the, the people that I'm around and people I'm working with is, um, it's really nice to just be receiving emails from, from others. Um, our peers or colleagues or someone who was still in school, um, that like, when I was still a student, it, it was a scary thing to be, you know, emailing, reaching out to, uh, people in companies uh, who I look up to, whose work I really admire, to be like reaching out to them to ask questions or or ask them or ask to connect. That was a really intimidating thing when I was still going to school. But turned out it's really like people are really generous. They love to connect with you. So I wish I'd done that more. Um, yeah, just like don't be afraid to reach out to those uh, whose work you admire. And most of the time, they'd be really willing to connect with you. Okay, great. Yeah, so let's move to a chasm. Yeah, um, Howard, I was going to say that, but I guess I have to pick somebody else now. Um, yeah, I think for me, I would say that you don't need to know everything when you work in the communication industry or the marketing um, industry. Um, you feel like as a new graduate or even just an undergrad that you have to have all the tools, have all the skills once you reach a workplace. I know that when I was younger, I also thought that, that I had to be an expert at my role prior to getting it. But you actually learn a lot on the field. And so, you know, that'll kind of lift a little bit of anxiety or any stress that you may have when, when finding a new job. But just understand that, you know, you learn a lot once you're on the field and you don't have to put a lot of pressure on yourself to know everything. Okay, great. Yes. Now, Sean, your turn. Um, I also was going to say something similar to Howard, so I'm going to try and mix it up a little bit and say, especially coming from SIA, which is a really project-based course, it, you don't really realize how much you're going to stay in contact with the people you work with and how much that can, that can help you or you are in a position to help other people getting jobs in the future. Even for me, just being five years removed, I've been in positions where I've hired people from SEAT that I've known before, and I've been hired by people that were my TAs in SEAT. So it's a lot smaller of a community once you get out into the world than you expect it to be, and it's nice to know people. Okay, great. Thanks, Sean. And uh, now, Tiana, your turn. Mm. Yeah, I've got uh, two pretty important things that I think were pretty vital to my learning. Um, so first off, uh, I wouldn't uh, get so set on your lifelong career instantly out of school. Try a bunch of different things, especially in the field of communication. There's so many different avenues you can take, like PR, marketing, communications. I think it's really important to find out which one of those that you like. And two, um, your job isn't everything. It's not your whole life. I know here we're very work to live, and I definitely took that on for a long time. And uh, over time, I became so much happier just loving my job while I'm at my job, doing my best there, and then outside of work, living life. Okay, yes, thank you. Yeah, so next uh, um, question on my list. So it's, uh, so you know, our, our students uh, you will, will find eventually they're going to just go hunting jobs, right? So and as new grads, they have some expectations. So I'm just kind of what is wondering, so what should be the appropriate expectation as a new grad when they just apply their first jobs? Okay, so um, yeah, so let's uh, start from Howard again. Wow, there is an alarm. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll go again. Wow, okay. This is, there's so much pressure. Um, I, um, in my experience, at least, um, uh, kind of the, the path I'm going on to or the way I'm, I'm getting these jobs is by kind of looking for it myself. There's a lot of great grants program. Um, BC Arts Council has a program called the Early Career Development uh, Grants, which is designed for um, new grads to, uh, to connect with, let's say, a company. It can either be a mentorship, a mentorship or internship, um, which is, and the grant kind of pays for your entire salary for a whole year working with the company. Um, I would say um, you would be kind of writing a lot of grants, I mean, in my experience, or in this kind of work, writing a lot of grants, writing a lot about yourself. Um, and this, uh, it's going to take practice. Um, you're not going to figure it out right away. And it's the kind of thing where you're going to need to practice how to write about yourself um, and write it concisely and, and 
sell yourself as an artist in a way um, and then kind of finding the way to sell yourself the best that the printing body can give you money <laughs> and uh, and um, but then also like connecting with theater companies and then reaching out because the companies will also help out help you out to sell you to the uh, the funding body so it's a lot of like writing about yourself and, and, and practicing that yeah okay thank you um, let's move on to Kathleen yeah, I would say expectations for applying to your first job. Um, this is just from my experience as well within the communications industry. But I would say kind of use your first job as a stepping stone in the workplace. So don't expect maybe your first job, it doesn't need, you know, at least for myself, it didn't need to meet all of my salary expectations. It didn't have to have the perfect, you know, corporate culture. But more so, I think the, the important thing for that being a stepping stone into the workplace is um, what exposure is it giving to you within the industry? What people are you meeting? Um, what type of mentorship are you getting? Are you learning? Are you gaining the skills and the tools that you're having at this first job that will kind of carry you into your, your future jobs or possibly growing in the company? And so I would say, yeah, it's not going to be your, it may not be your end-all be-all. And so use it as a stepping stone um, and just see if this job that you're applying for offers you the tools to actually help you grow in your career. Okay, yeah, thanks. So now, Sean. Um, yeah, uh, kind of touching on similar things. I think the reality of the situation coming out of school is that it looking for your first job may be the most competitive environment in your working career going forward because you're fresh out. You need to distinguish yourself from everybody else who's fresh out. Um, so don't get too down on yourself if you have to apply a lot. It happens to all of us. And it's not personal, so don't take it personally. It's just a reality of you've got to get out there. You've got to be your best self and, and make yourself stand out to get that first job on your resume, and it gets easier from there. Okay. Yeah, great advice. Eh? So uh, next, um, Tiana. Hi. Um, so when applying for your first job, as Sean was saying, it is extremely competitive, and it can be a bit discouraging at first, especially as a new grad who is probably – had a lot of experience, example, at co-op or by being on CMNSU or anything like that. Um, but yeah, just don't get discouraged. Um, and out of your first job, you'll probably want to look at the skills that you want to acquire from that job and the kind of experience that you'll get. Maybe you won't get into the industry that you would like at first, but perhaps those skills that you learned at your first job can be transferable to your dream job in your dream industry. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, next question um, in my list is, um, you know, how to make your resume stand out? I bet uh, a lot of students, when they first go out to hunt their jobs, so, so that's something that I really care about. So let's just, again, start with uh, Howard, please. Okay, I'll start. I, I won't say too much. I think I'll leave it for the others, um, because in my experience, it may be different in my field. I mean, for actors, it's a very specific, different kind of layout. It's one page, it doesn't be concise, it's like different formatting. That's an entire workshop on its own. Um, the theater artists, we also do CVs, which is a little bit different. Uh, um, it's just it's showcase a body, your entire portfolio or, or um, body of work. Um, and it's important that in those uh, CV situations to show range. Um, when you're applying for some of the early grants for Canada Council for the Arts, now they, they allow uh, new and early career artists, which are like freshly undergrads, to make a profile and apply uh, from there. And in order to, to get that profile approved, you have to upload a CV. And for that, I think um, just collect, uh, you want to showcase your, the range of your work in those tastes. So um, even if it's something you've done at school, uh, the more you can, you can show that you're either interdisciplinary or or you know, touch on many different fields of, of different practices, that's, I think, the most important thing in, in this particular instance, at least. Yeah. Yeah, OK, sounds good. So now, Kathleen, please. Yeah, I would say to make your resume stand out in terms of you know, the digital marketing space, I think it's important for you to exactly kind of what Howard said, to be able to showcase all your diverse skills. So within digital marketing, you know, showcasing that essentially you are a good, you know, copywriter, that you have graphic design skills, um, that obviously that your your experience within the resume is applicable to the role that you're applying to. 
That being said, you know, filtering through multiple resumes at a time during the hiring process. If your resume stands out when it comes to graphic design, then make sure that it looks aesthetically pleasing. So whether or not that's done through an Illustrator program or if it's done through Canva, even though know, Canva is actually getting quite robust when it comes to their graphic templates, but making it stand out in an aesthetically pleasing way instead of done through a Word document will, will kind of set you apart from some, someone else. Um, as well as making sure that once again, the content when it comes to copywriting for a digital marketing role, that's very important. So if you're speaking in past tense, keep it past tense. If you're speaking in present tense, keep it present tense and make sure that everything's grammatically correct. Triple check your work. I've seen a lot of typos in resumes that are being sent out to multiple companies. So um, I would say that would make your resume stand out. Okay, great. So um, Sean. So, so Sean, since you you're from Seat, so you know Seat, uh, you know doing design, media art, that kind of thing. So, could we just uh, involve with uh, you know portfolio piece along with the resume? So, if you can share a bit about that, that would be great. Yeah. Um, so I was going to say similar things to Kathleen coming from design that obviously make it make it look great and make it usable and readable because that's part of what you want to do for your job if you're working in those roles. But the other thing to me is when I've been in positions looking at 20, 30 resumes a day for somebody trying to work in games is show me that you can do the thing that you're telling me you want to come do. And whether that's a co-op or in my case there wasn't co-ops in games. So I worked as a TA in my undergrad or just made games in my spare time, whatever the case may be, just I want the guy who can do the thing that he says that he can do. And wherever you can do to prove that to me, that you can do this thing, or at least have tried to do the thing. And whether you failed it or not, like show me that you've done it or tried to do it and learn something from it. Sounds good. Okay, thanks so much. Um, yeah, Tiana. Yeah, kind of going off of what Sean said, I would absolutely advise that it's aesthetically pleasing. Um, that's a good way to show that, especially in a role that is in marketing or communications, you do want to have that aesthetically pleasing resume, but also you want to tailor your resume to each job that you are applying to. I know it's a lot of extra work, but um, look for those keywords that they have on the job description and make sure they're included in the resume so it's easy for the recruiter or the HR person or the hiring manager to identify. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, so um, next question in my list. So uh, then I may ask uh, Elena to provide the with some, uh, you know, uh, questions raised on the fly. So uh, the next question. Um, so, you know, um, we you try to go hunting a job and then companies typically will ask, do you have experience, uh, even Canadian experience, right? So, uh, you know, and then uh, as a new student, that's pretty challenging, right? So we're just wondering, you know, as students, so uh, when you are just studying, so how can you just get out there and then uh, get some experience, at least? Yeah, okay, Okay. so uh, start from Howard again. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, in my experience, uh, there's a, uh, or in SCA, we have a great faculty, uh, and I'm sure this is like across the entire uh, a faculty of in FCAT as well, but in ACA, all the all the faculty professors are working artists, and they do work. Uh, they do their own work, usually over the summer because they're teaching throughout the year. In the summer, they're working. Uh, I would say, like, talk to your profs, um, ask them what they're working on, and then uh, you know, I, I don't know how much they could ask this, but try to put yourself in the room for those things. Um, you know, like express your interest. You tell them you're interested in the in the kind of work. Um, I think that's a really great way, you know, you know, if a professor knows your work already, knows your work ethics in class, you know, if if you express interest to them, if there's opening, they will remember you to say, oh, you know what, we've got, we have space to, like, bring you into the room, even just as, on the, as a fly on the wall or, you know, as a participating collaborator. Um, I just think that there's, we have so many fantastic uh, professors in the faculty that, you know, these are people you already know and they know your work already, so that's a good way to start, just to talk to them and, and uh, see if you can uh, work on their project, if it's possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, good suggestion. So now, Kathleen. Yeah, I would say, you know, attending networking events and meeting other people within the industry and possibly asking if they even have internship positions that you can take right out of undergrad. Um, and being creative with getting your experience as well. Um, there's actually a woman that I was speaking to and, you know, she's an undergrad, but she's also a heavy graphic designer. And this is not any work that she's actually produced on her own. She hasn't been out in the workplace yet or anything like that. But she actually reached out to a lot of small businesses who are still starting up through social media, because social media can meet a ton of people. 
Um, and she actually offered her work for free, being able to do an entire branding deck as well as a brand strategy plan. That being said, as long as you know these, these small businesses that are starting out are getting free services, but she's allowed to use it in her portfolio, that's a way to kind of gain experience in a way that you know is, is a creative way. You can build up your portfolio and actually use it for a job once you apply for it. Sounds great. Thanks. So, Sean. Um, yeah, I, a lot of my experience with this was similar to Howard's in that what I found in SEAT is that the faculty was great when you put in the effort and showed that you had a passion to want to be involved more. You got out what you put in. So a couple like just specific examples is I worked with Eric as a TA during my undergrad, which was a pretty unusual time. And I also worked with Carmen Newsetter, who's the dean of FCAT now, on running a, our own event for game design internships and things like that, because that didn't really exist back then. And this, none of this stuff was kind of scheduled or planned or anything like that. It was just if you put in the time and you put in the effort and you show someone that you want to work on something with them, a lot of times people will be responsive to that. Great. Thanks, John. Yeah. Tiana, please. All right, so aside from the SFU co-op program, which is fantastic, I highly recommend if you haven't uh, been a part of that yet, if you're a communications student, um, there are ways to get experience, even if you're working, let's say, a part-time job in retail. Um, for example, when I was working in retail while in school just to make some money, I actually asked um, one of the managers if I could help out with the social media. So if it's a place where you already are, you can find ways to help out there. And also, uh, for a lot of job applications, they look for writing samples. So if they're looking, for example, press releases and you don't have any, you can just draft some up yourself. And you can also pitch to local outlets, news outlets, media outlets, uh, just to get some of your work published so you can show that off to um, any hiring managers. OK, great. Good points there. Uh, so uh, I, I still have questions, actually. But uh, I'm just wondering, uh, Elena, did you, did you recognize some questions that you call in common, you know, you know, interest that, that uh, you know, we can ask our folks here. Yeah, I can jump in here. We actually received a question from Bex um, for you all, just about has there ever been a career mistake um, that you've learned from or a career mistake that someone else has made that you've kind of recognized? And how do you jump back from a career mistake in your career? I guess we can start with Kathleen, maybe. Um, OK, so a career mistake that I've spotted. Is that, is that kind of the question, Elena, and how that was rectified? Um, career mistake. I would say, you know, even just during right now, I, I guess I can, yeah, let me speak from my experience at, at my company at the moment. Um, growing pains are real. So as a company is growing from a startup to a mid-sized business, there's a lot of mistakes that you'll make, whether or not is how, how do you should best support your employees during a time like this when they're overworked, you know, and having to hire at a very quick speed with not knowing the, if we even have the funds to do it. And so that being said, um, I would say, yeah, I think there's been times where, you know, a lot of the work becomes go, 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 and you kind of lose sight of, you know, the people actually working and making sure that their mental health, their mental health and their headspace when it comes to them coming into the job is priority um, when it comes to anything else. And so there have been many times where we've really had to sit down and, and really revisit our values at the company to be like, you know, our people come first. And how are we going to make sure that they're taken care of about, um, about our clients first and foremost, um, and that'll translate into the client work that we produce. That's a great answer. I feel like everyone should always make sure, no matter what career you're in, you're always putting yourself first before the actual position, because I mean, like, you're not going to do a good job at your position if you aren't putting your mental health first. Um, I guess next, Sean, do you want to kind of jump in and see if you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I was thinking similar like on the similar line and we touched on a bit earlier about your work-life balance so when I started my first job out as a smaller startup and that's indicative of having to do a lot more than you would at a larger company and have a lot more expectations placed on you from the beginning which is a great opportunity to grow but it's also important to to have that balance and also know your worth as an employee and to get through that sometimes you just have to go through different positions and see oh at, at this company it's this way and at this company it's this way and you get a better sense over time and through experience what your value is and what you bring and what is fair to expect of you and not to put too much of yourself into a position yeah that's a great response as well um tiana and howard do you guys have anything else to add on to that anything different or anything like that I, 
I will say something. Um, this is like when when I was thinking about this. No, I've never heard about it. No one really talks about this, but um, I I once got a producer role for a project, and then when I got it, I didn't really investigate what the work was. So I was like, oh, a job, great. Knew the company, great. Took the producer role. Turned out the the content of the show was um, I wouldn't say exactly problematic, but it was something that like didn't exactly align with my politics or the kind of casting decision, et cetera. And I was in a kind of a steady situation that, uh, and because I had the title of producer and, and turned out being okay. But one of the thing I ended up doing is uh, talking to the, uh, like, this was a hard, intimidating decision to make, but talk, sitting down with the, the company producer. And uh, the thing I did that really helped me out was to create distance from the work. I kind of just changed my title from a producer to production manager. And for some reason, that kind of alleviated the, the pressure um, of the producer having artistic control over the, the show. Because in, in fact, I didn't have artistic control over that show. Um, and and it was something that was really scary, especially in, in the early time of producing, to be like, ah, oh, I don't want the show to be like, completely take down, take down my career because of something uh, of the show. And it the show ended up being okay, being fine. but. Um, that was something I, I learned was like creating distance. Just the, one little trick of like even changing the title for me to create distance from the work really helped me in in uh, in separating myself from some let's say a work that didn't align with me in my politics. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great response as well, Howard. Um, Tiana, do you have anything else to add on to that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think the biggest mistake I had made in my career was overdoing it. There was a time when I was in school where I was working five jobs just because I wanted to make sure that I could get a job right out of university. And it impacted my physical health, my mental health, and I just kept going. So I think if anyone is looking to gain experience like ahead of applying for the first job out of university, absolutely do it. That's why we're all here to gain experience. But just um, make sure that you have time to take care of yourself and your physical and mental health. Great responses. Um, we have time for one more question, and I'm just going to ask uh, a question from Winona. Um, is how picky should you be at finding your first job? Um, Sean, do you want to jump on that first? Yeah, for sure. I, I think it's a balance where, again, I think we talked about this earlier, your first job isn't necessarily going to define your career. It's most important to get something on your resume and, and take that first step into what it's like to work. But at the same time, I wouldn't say just take the first job that comes your way. Ultimately, you want to be happy with what you're doing on some level, even if it's not perfect that you, you feel motivated and you want to do this. Um, so I think it maybe just take a step back on an individual level and say, what am I what are maybe some things that are non-starters or uh, deal breakers when it comes to getting this job or I have to have this or I have to have that, but be flexible because it's not, you, you're going to change jobs many times through your career. It's not a big commitment beyond getting that experience. Awesome. I totally agree with that. Um, Tiana, do you want to jump in and say something about your point of view with being picky about finding your first job? Yeah, for sure. I think there are, uh, places in which you can be picky and which maybe you should be a little more relaxed on. So for example, maybe be picky on the type of work you'll be doing. So if you want to do social media, then absolutely like only take those social media jobs over a copywriter gig or um, just marketing gig or communications job. Um, where to be less picky is probably the industry it's in. Um, so if you really want to work in entertainment, um, those are a little more competitive. So if there is something else that's out there that interests you and something might interest you or it might not even be something you're that interested in, but the people that work there are fantastic. So that is, yeah, I would say be picky about the skills you'll acquire, but the industry, you can always work your way up to where you want to be. Awesome. Uh, Kathleen, do you want to add something on to that? Yeah, I'll just pick off about um, on what Tiana was mentioning, but I would say also be picky when it comes to management. Um, you want to make sure that the people who are managing you are, once again, putting their employees first, um, that they have a good reputation, so you can look at that on Glassdoor, you can look at other reviews online. Um, and what I also recommend, you know, undergrads when they're applying for the first job as well, is if there's any other individuals who are in, let's say, they're applying for a digital marketing assistant position or a coordinator position, 
um, for them to reach out to those uh, actually working at the job and as, as a digital marketing coordinator within the role on LinkedIn, meet for a virtual coffee, ask them their experience at the company. They're going to be more honest to you than maybe the managers are if, you know, if by chance um, management isn't that great there. And so just really getting that one-on-one -on -one interaction with people actually in the job. Once again, the people at your job is a large reason why people stay and management is a enormous part of why people stay at, at the job that they're in and so I would say yeah very much be um, particular when it comes to those things. Awesome and Howard you want to finish us off with that question? Yeah um, I will say in my experience um, I would find uh, I would identify the people you I want to work with um, the people the company whose work you admire the, the company and the collaborators you want to be working with um, in my experience, the companies are really flexible with uh, uh, with the roles. I will say like that. That's why it's so good to have a range of skills. Um, once you identify those people, to you get yourself into the room, um, and th that so that's a good advantage. Of if you have, if you can do a whole bunch of things, you can find. Oh, do you need someone who needs? Do you need a stage manager? Do you need this? Do you need that? Once you get yourself into the room, now you're in a room with these people. Now you can have conversations, and I don't think you need to, you need to be worried about the being defined by that role in that particular project. I think once you're in the room, uh, once you meet each other, then you will have the opportunity later on to, to do the role that you would like to do with these people. But I think it's more important to get into the room first and identify the people you want to be working with. Yeah. Awesome. Um, that concludes okay. our alumni section of our event. Thank you so much for attending. I really appreciate you guys making the time on your day to come and attend our conference. I'm sure we all learned a lot from these, this panel. I mean, I, for myself, I learned quite a bit being a communication student still. Um, but yeah, I appreciate you all coming out and thank you, Eric, for moderating the panel. Um, so yeah, we can all leave the screen now and then Carmen will be giving our closing remarks at the moment. Yeah, okay. thank you all. Yeah, thank you all. And also thank all the audiences. All right, I am back. Thank you, everybody. Yes, a big thank you to our audience. Um, I think it's been a fantastic evening. I hope you enjoyed all of the presentations as much as I did. Congratulations to all the student presenters on their wonderful achievements. We hope you enjoyed your time being here, and we hope that the memories and the connections you made today will stay with you always. As we begin to wrap up for the evening, I would like to take this moment to acknowledge all of the people that made this conference possible. First, let's give a big round of applause to our faculty ambassadors, Sun Ha Hong, Robert Kitsos, and Eric Yang. While I can't see you applauding, you can applaud in the chat through any creative means possible you can think of. Well done to our FCAT faculty ambassadors. Next, a massive thanks and round of applause to the UGC Planning Committee, our FCAT staff members, Jyoti Euker, Andrea Barbera, Tessa perkins Dino, Marilyn Brimacombe, Nicole Manson, and last but most definitely not least, Elena Steika. Thank you everyone for your efforts and dedication in putting this conference together. Special thanks also goes out to the FCAT Dean's Office, FCAT School Communicators, and FCAT School Advisors for their support. So continue with your round of applause with me. And thank you to my assistant, Maria Barba, for her help with my speech and all the practice runs I did. I won't tell you how many times I had her listen to me and give advice um, on my speech for tonight. So thank you, Maria. Thanks also to our alumni panel, uh, Howard Dye, Kathleen Esten Islau, Sean Warwick, and Tiana Marcanauto. Also, thank you to Josh Carway and Jen To from the SFU Meeting Event and Conference Services team who have helped us set up this event at Hoppin. Without them, the conference would have not been possible by any stretch. I'd also like to thank Jeff Ward for coming out to be here as our special keynote speaker and for sharing your experiences with us today. You are really an inspiration to us all. Thank you, Jeff. I would also like to take this moment once again to thank all of our sponsors, the SFU Alumni Association, the SFU Bookstore, Evo Carshare, Meat, The Old Spaghetti Factory, Vancouver Water Adventures, and Colonel's Popcorn for their amazing prizes and being part of our event. That concludes the evening, folks. Thank you, everyone, for coming out to support our students for our 11th annual FCAT Undergraduate Conference. We will see you next year. <laughs>